I'm Susan Mueller. We've all seen the popular television program Antiques Roadshow, where art experts identify works of art. But how do they know this stuff? Let's find out. On Antiques Roadshow, the emphasis is definitely on how much money you can make from selling antiques gathering dust in your attic. I emphasize the word can. While some antiques are very valuable, most are not worth a huge amount of money. But monetary value is not necessarily the point. Artworks and antiques, besides being beautiful and interesting, are tangible links to the past and should be cherished. And if you know what to look for, you may even run across something of real monetary value. It's what we live for, right? Even if we decide not to sell it. In this program, we're going to learn the basics of stylistic analysis, the first step towards becoming an art expert. Not so you can fill your house with antiques or find lost paintings by Leonardo da Vinci, although that would be great, but because knowing how to look at and correctly identify artworks will make your next museum visit even more enjoyable. And if you're in school, you will do much better on your next art history quiz. That much I can promise. To begin, let's look at the concept of style. Every artist, every culture, all time periods and all art movements have their own style. Style is the way something is done. The quickest way to understand this is to look at the styles of various past decades. The 1920s, the 1950s, the 1960s, the 1980s. If you can easily and quickly recognize the stylistic characteristics of these decades, you can do the same thing with works of art. Here are the basic elements of style. Composition, the way the objects are arranged on the picture plane. For example, Renaissance artists Raphael and Leonardo da Vinci often use triangular compositions. Fauve artist André Duran liked to give the viewer a bird's eye view of the scene. Color, just like everyone, artists have their favorite colors, which they tend to use over and over again. Van Gogh's colors are especially easy to recognize, lots of intense cadmium yellow, orange, and ultramarine blue. The colors an artist typically uses is referred to as the artist's color palette. This is Van Gogh's color palette. Subject matter in art is very diverse and can include anything. Although most artists paint many different subjects during their careers, eventually they specialize. French artist Claude Monet, for example, considered himself a landscape artist, although he also painted still lifes and a few portraits. This is the only self-portrait Monet ever painted. It wasn't a subject that interested him. And of course, there is the question of whether an artist paints realistically, abstractly, in a non-objective style, or something else. This can be tricky for art experts because artists tend to create works in different styles and media. For example, all these works were done by Ukrainian artist Kasimir Majewicz. All of these by Pablo Picasso. Materials, media, and methods used are also important elements of style. English artist Aubrey Beardsley was an illustrator who only worked in pen and ink. Most of his illustrations are in black and white, but some include color. But he rarely used oil paint, although one small oil painting by Beardsley has been found. It's painted on both sides. So if you run across an oil painting that looks like a Beardsley, it's either not by the artist or it's very rare and worth checking into. Which brings us to the all-important hand of the artist which is very distinctive, just like handwriting. This category includes the way the paint, ink, chalk, and so on is applied, as well as the way the artist draws. Hands, eyes, drapery, trees, well, everything. The hand of the artist is so unique that it can even be used to identify ancient artists. For example, the Amasis painter from ancient Greece. Although we do not know his name, we can recognize his individual style. Now that you know all this, you can compare and contrast a known work to one that you do not recognize and see what stylistic elements they have in common. Then you make an identification. Being able to do this is known as connoisseurship. If the stylistic elements do not match up, or they do match up, but there's something about the artwork that makes you think it might be a copy or a fake, the same principles apply. Compare and contrast the unknown work to a real work by the same artist. Look at the stylistic elements such as color, brushstroke, composition, and so on. Then make your determination. 
this is a fake Van Gogh. The fraudster has taken the composition from a real Van Gogh self-portrait, changed the color somewhat, and added an easel, taken from another real Van Gogh self-portrait. But the brush stroke is crude, and the likeness unsure and obviously copied. So, fake. There are actually very few fake paintings out there, although there are many hand-painted copies as well as posters and prints that can fool you, especially if the prints themselves are old or are of artworks that were originally made as prints themselves. Here is an original 19th century woodblock print of the Great Wave by Japanese artist Katsushika Hokusai. The first edition was printed in 1831 when around 5,000 copies were made. It's still very popular and being reproduced today in different versions, sizes, and media. There are probably some of those original prints from 1831 out there, and you could run across one. But there are also a lot of antique and vintage prints that are not from the original series, but look like they might be because they are old. These old prints are not fakes, but innocently made reproductions. But not all are marked as reproductions. So think twice about buying one thinking that it might be an original because the original 1831 print of the Great Wave is very, very rare. Bringing us to our next topic. How can you tell the difference between an original work of art and an innocently made reproduction or museum replica? In addition, works are also made in the style of and as homages. An homage is when an artist makes their own version of another person's work as a tribute or as a reinterpretation of the original work. For example, L-H-O-O-Q by Marcel Duchamp. Called a ready-made aided, Duchamp took a print of the Mona Lisa, the ready-made, and aided it by drawing on a beard and mustache. Then there are those artworks made as part of a revivalist movement, such as Egyptian revival a style you are very likely to run across. But except for deliberate fakes, none of these are meant to fool anyone, although they sometimes do. Egyptian art has been of great interest ever since 1798 when Napoleon's troops shot the nose off the Sphinx. No, they didn't do that. It's an urban myth. However, Napoleon and his army did help themselves to countless Egyptian antiquities and brought them back to France where they caused a sensation, not just in France, but throughout Europe and the United States. This inspired the first wave of Egyptian revival. As more discoveries were made and more tourists flocked to Egypt, Egyptian revival art, clothing, jewelry, furniture, and all kinds of assorted knickknacks became extremely popular. These are the kinds of things you may very well find in your grandmother's jewelry box, in a thrift store, or in an attic of some old house, and they can be quite valuable as well as being beautiful and interesting. Egyptian revival is a real art style. It's not fake Egyptian art. However, along with Egyptian revival, there are also a lot of fake Egyptian artifacts out there that have been made to look real and are being sold as dating from ancient Egypt. This has been going on now for 200 years. So fake Egyptian artifacts made to sell to tourists in say 1850 or 1920 now look and feel old because they are old. Therefore, they can be hard to distinguish from authentic ancient artifacts. So, if you run across such an object and wonder if it just might be authentic, this is the time to put your stylistic analysis skills to use. Familiarize yourself with what authentic Egyptian art looks like from all eras, from King Narmer to Queen Cleopatra. What's the composition like? How are the figures posed? What's the subject matter? What colors are used? What kind of paint and ceramic glaze? What are the expressions on the faces? How are decorative details handled? Here's a quiz. Which of these mummy masks do you think is fake? Of course, the mask on the left. Look at the lopsided grin and the crude, simplistic decorative details. Here are some further examples. It's amazing how many fake Egyptian artifacts are being sold online. This crude and obviously fake so-called Ptolemaic period burial mask from a select private collector has the worst attempt at hieroglyphics I've ever seen. But it's still sold online for $120. Clearly not a bargain any way you look at it. 
So before you buy any artwork online or in a shop, put your art expert skills to work before you part with any money. But you can find authentic artworks and antiques if you know what to look for. I've actually found quite a few. For the 10-Minute Professor, this is Dr. Susan Ray Euler. Thanks for tuning in.